Hi, and welcome to Pope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is today's message. Would you take your scriptures this morning and would you go to the book of Ephesians in the sixth chapter? I'm very glad to be here this morning, um, not only because of the like interest that your pastor has in the area of prayer, um, and frankly, that's, that's a, an unusual thing, and it's also unusual for him to say, I think our congregation is ready for this. So uh, he knows your, your status, he knows the, he's, the, he's the shepherd. He knows what's going on in the congregation. He says this is something I think we're ready for. I'm also glad to be here because I know your pastor is short. And uh, so I don't have to worry about a mammoth pulpit. So uh, I'm in a different church about every Sunday. And uh, you never know from a, from a five, six, five, seven on a good day um, guy. Uh, sometimes it's a little ominous. I was in a church and... I was in a church in, uh, I think of where it was, it was in Aurora, uh, Aurora, Colorado, and the, the pulpit was like way up here, all right, and I looked, but I knew their assistant pastor was shorter than I am, um, and I kept looking at him and wondering, how does he speak back here, how does this, so I thought, well, he roams, and I find myself roaming, and get that. but I, then I looked out, and there was a stool under the pulpit, so I pulled that out, and I said, uh, brothers, is this your stool? He says, sure. Is. So I got climbed up on that to where it was normal. And um, I think uh, one of these days when we get to heaven, we're all going to be 5'6", because we're going to be perfect. Um, but uh, one, of those, one of those things. Uh, I also appreciate, appreciate uh, Pastor Will mentioning this, and I hadn't, I hadn't uh, actually planned on saying this, but it's true that every great working really from the 1700s through the beginning of the, of the 1900s, every great spiritual awakening that we know of, both in the UK and in America, was preceded by prayer. And specifically, corporate prayer. And beyond that, most of the time, teenagers praying. So the teenagers were tender-hearted. The parents may have been rough and callous, but the teenagers were tender-hearted. And the teenagers would get together and pray, and God brought, God answered their prayers. And God did miraculous things through God's people praying. And so um, we'd like to talk about this this morning. Uh, this, is, this is a little bit um, mixed in that every, we, we like the blessings that comes from corporate prayer. We like, we'd love to see revival come to our country. We'd love to see revival come to Greer. We'd love to see revival come to Hope Chapel. Maybe we're not even certain what that would look like. It might be a little messy. But we'd like to see a, a great working of the Lord come here. But often with that is great oppression. You find in the scriptures the New Testament was written by persecuted believers to persecuted believers. And we like to separate that and say, look at what the great things were going on in the book of Acts. But they were oppressed in the book of Acts. Uh, we, have, uh, we have this Hollywood mentality that everything can be beautiful, and, and yet in the Scriptures there's lots of oppression that comes with spiritual progress. And so uh, I, I, I enter into these couple of Sundays with some real, real question marks as to will you embrace this and are we really ready to even say, Lord, we want your blessing, we want to see the incredible things that you could do, but we also open ourselves up to what you bring to us. If it means oppression if it means persecution, if it means confession of sin, if it means even some heartache, then bring that. Um, this last fall, I was in Ukraine, and I got to see many of the brothers and sisters in Christ as they pray, and when they pray, they have their hands out like this in prayer, and as they're praying, these are folks that have, some of them have come through the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet bloc oppression, but... Um, they have their hands out and they're saying, basically, Lord, here's my life. I give you my life in my praying, but I also not only am offering my life, I'm accepting whatever you have for me. And if it's good or bad, I'll take it as from your good hand. 
And then when they say amen, they take it and they, they rub it from the, from the top of their face all the way down their body. And it's a little unusual to an American eyeballs to see that. But these are people that have known oppression and are knowing incredible blessing of the Lord. And they're saying it may be good and it may be what we see bad, but it's from a good God. We'll accept it. So, um, so I'd like to challenge you with that this morning. Um, and we'll start here in a few moments in Ephesians chapter 6. But I'll preface uh, these comments by one other thing, and, uh, I, and I struggle sometimes how to phrase this. I think my wife gave me a newspaper article a while back about it. My wife grew up in the Thumb area of Michigan. And, oh, I'm going to say this, by the way. Happy Mother's Day, okay? From, this is um, ladies. Um, I'll even say to the men, Happy Mother's Day. You know, we can do that. But this may be um, a difficult day for some. You know, this is, we have four children uh, two are married and uh, two are unmarried, uh, but we have four in heaven as well. So because of some pre-birth uh, incidents, we have four waiting for us in heaven that we've never seen, and every one of those was a difficulty, and every one of those is a life uh, for which Christ died. And, and uh, we, we know that there's, uh, sometimes it's bittersweet. Sometimes it's very sweet. Um, but we want to just say uh, to you joyful Mother's Day, um, however uh, you have approached this day. Um, but my wife was raised in the Thumb area of Michigan, uh, in that city of Croswell, Michigan. If I were to mention this to you, some of you older people, and I'm not going to qualify what older is. I know your pastor is really old because we were in school 75 years ago. Um, so uh, some of you older people, if I were to say to you, today we have dollar stores, but a long time ago we had five and dime stores. Okay, so there's some older folks here. Um, at least maybe historical, uh, knowledgeable folks. Uh, this is a story about a, uh, this is a newspaper account about a, a town that had a, inside the town had a store called Ben Franklin. It's a Ben Franklin five and dime. Over the weekend, a group of uh, rambunctious junior hires broke into the store and changed the price tags on many of the things in the stores to where a, uh, a, a large television had, had the price, tra- uh, price tags. This, this is before we did, you know, computer actually had tags on the item. Um, uh, had the, the, the large television had the price tag of a box of Kleenex. And the box of Kleenex was $599. Uh, they swapped the value of these articles. And as I read that, later down the road as I read that, I thought, you know, isn't that what our adversary, the devil, would like to do? He would like to get our minds changed in the priorities of our life to where the things that God values, we don't. The things that God maybe doesn't value as much, we live real high and spend a lot of time on. And I'm going to encourage you this morning that what we're talking about this morning is of high value to God. Now, we've been talking about prayer um, and I'm going I'm to make a little bit of a dichotomy here. There is, there is individual prayer and there is corporate prayer. Both are mentioned in the Scriptures. For the most part, we find individual prayers up until the book of Acts. And after the book of Acts, we see a big gear change in the, in the direction of prayer and it is primarily corporate prayer. It's primarily God's people praying together. And this is where I want to challenge your thoughts this morning. Not necessarily in individual prayer, although that is important, but in what it means for God's people to pray together. If it's a biblical model, we ought to be doing it, even if it's different than what we have been doing. Now, because I get to be in a lot of churches, um, primarily in a missions context, uh, I'll tell you right now, as Americans, at least what I see in the American church, we're very nervous about, about talking out loud. We're very nervous about opening our hearts to others. We're very nervous even about talking in prayer to God with others. And I'm not exactly certain how that is. I'll, I, have a, a, I have a supposition, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that here in a few moments. But there is corporate prayer and individual prayer, and in the Scriptures, there seems to be even a greater importance put on corporate prayer than individual prayer. So follow with me as we read in just a few moments in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. I think in your notes uh, you have a, a, a sentence there that if you're a note taker, you'll want to fill this in. All of the followers of Jesus are in a battle. 
If you are a follower of Jesus, you are in a battle. And we don't like to think about that because none of us like to be in battle. But we live in a spiritual warfare. We're in a battle. And if you think of this, there's battles for the righteousness of the Lord to be prospered. We'd love to see our, we'd love to see our government officials make righteous choices instead of unrighteous choices. We're in a battle. We'd love to see our children make righteous choices instead of unrighteous choices. Uh, there's a battle for the hearts and minds of others. God, bring this person to yourself. God, would you change this person's heart? Give this person spiritual desires, whereas right now they don't. There's a, it's a battlefield. In fact, A.W. Tozer said, often we think of this world as a playground when in essence it is a battleground. Um, there's a battlefield for the, the sanctification of believers. You and I battle progressive sanctification. I trust you can look back in your life and you can say, I'm not today what I was once. And I can see spiritual progress in my life. But you can also say, I'm not where I need to be. Therefore, I need to keep moving. And that keeping moving is a battle. Paul says that the things that I would do, I don't. The things that I don't do, I should. It's a spiritual battle. We're also in a, in a spiritual battle for the deliverance of captives. So you have folks in addictions. You have folks that are um, materialistic. We have folks that are in, in horrible relationships. These folks are in bondage. Maybe you're in bondage. Maybe I'm in bondage. We have to have a place in our life where we understand that's warfare and that's battle. And we're praying. I, 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 um, I'll not take a lot of time with this, but what a, what a really neat thing happened when I... Um, I, my wife and I and family pastored a church in the Denver area for almost 27 years, 10 years as youth pastor, and then 17 as pastor. And, and um, uh, a man by the name of Ron who was an alcoholic. Uh, we didn't know it. Um, he was actually one of our church leaders, and uh, he was an alcoholic. Um, turned out that we did find out about it. A horrible, horrible story. And, um, but what a, what a really neat thing to do to have a congregation praying for one person that allows himself to be prayed for by the congregation, puts himself in their care, and as the congregation prays, he is strengthened in his walk with the Lord, and in incredible things, he said, Pastor, this is, this is different than it's ever been in my life. I see a grace and a strength in my life that I've never had, and I attribute it to God's people praying. Now, I can't tell you right now that he is, in, is doing well, because he's... He's separated himself from church. He's separated himself from his family. And he's, uh, he's living a horrible life. But when he allowed God's people to pr be praying for him, he had incredible strength. My wife was saying the other day, probably the greatest time of greatest joy in our church life is, has been when our congregation's praying together. So there is something to this matter of even the deliverance of captives. And then specifically, I'd like for us to think as we, these next couple days, couple Sundays, um, warfare in the advance of the gospel. So your ministry here is not a social club. Many churches today have ended up with social clubs. Your ministry here is to be in Greer and the surrounding areas for the advance of the gospel. Jesus Christ said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. So you're not here just to say, maybe let's get, a, let's get you know, nice pictures on the wall. Let's enjoy each other's fellowship. You're here to reach people for Jesus Christ. And, uh, and part of that is referred to as the advance of the gospel. And part of that is furthered by prayer. And we do battle royal for the advance of the gospel. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, if you could look in verse 10, and I'm going to ask you, and I'm, because I was a youth pastor for quite a while, I, and I don't know if you do this or not, and if you don't do it, maybe you will. Uh, I don't know how interactive you are. If I ask you a question, will you respond? And if you don't respond, can I embarrass, and I won't embarrass you, but if, 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 uh, if, you, if you won't respond, then maybe by the end of two days you will respond. But um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask, after we get down past about verse 12, um, what that blank in your notes should say. All right? And then, this, then the same thing uh, probably in the next section as well. So Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. 
And in your mind, or if you're a Bible marker, you can actually say, why is that necessary? Verse 12. Why? Because, for we do not wrestle, and it's, the word wrestle is a fierce wrestling match. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to hear a word. The battle in, is in a... I don't even know how... I didn't bring my notes. What's, what's the blank? Tell you, let me get my notes. All right. I think my notes are back here. Uh, that one. Okay. Okay, the battle is in a what we can't see. Somebody offer a word. A place. A realm is getting probably closer. Place and realm are both well. A world. Let's dimension. Who said dimension? Bingo. Okay, she gets, a pastor's going to give you something after the service. Um, <clears throat> maybe a gift. <laughs> I don't know. Um, right over there. Yeah, right, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's good. So a dimension. A dimension we can't see. Hmm. And most of you know, because we have one, two, three, you probably can't see that one, uh, screens, and if you watch the news, you're going to find lots of motion. We live in a very video-saturated culture. The things that we see are the things that are real to us. The things that we can't see, you've heard the phrase, out of sight, out of mind, we just don't even hardly pay attention to them. It's a video, a, a visual culture, and so I'm going to recommend to us that just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So we are in a dimension. The battle, according to these verses in Ephesians 6, is in a dimension we can't see. Second question. Um, actually, it's number three. Um, so I'm going to fill this in because um, for lack of time, how do we battle in a dimension we can't see? How do we do this battle? Verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6. Praying. Because we're skipping through the armor. That's not because it's not important, but it doesn't serve our purposes this morning. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And by the way, this is after the book of Acts. This is written to the church at Ephesus. It is referring to corporate prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And here is the result of God's people praying together. Verse 19. And also for me, so Paul, that my words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly. Now, if you can do this, and I don't, I don't know that I can do this, but if you think of this word boldly, and you can somehow compartmentalize that word and bring it back to your mind next Sunday... We're going to be talking about a text in the book of Acts that has to do with this word boldly. But here's a down payment on this. This word boldly does not mean courage. In fact, if you see, um, opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So this is the advance of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In our New Testaments, this word boldly is used several times. Eight out of the nine specific uses of the word boldly, have the association of the Holy Spirit. So this is a Holy Spirit activity that comes into play as we're praying that we don't have if we're not praying. So if that, if that stirs your heart, hmm, that's what I want, that's what our church needs, if it means the advance of the Gospel, it means the, the connection of the Holy Spirit, and if we're praying, there is the ministry of the Holy Spirit where it wouldn't be if we weren't praying, wow, we need this next Sunday. Okay, um, so how do we do this battle? In your Bibles, please, would you go to 2 Kings chapter 6? 2 Kings, and if you want to put a marker in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to read quite a bit of Scripture, make a few parallel. I want to show you this is not Rick Cross. This is not Rick Cross-isms. Uh, this is the Word of God. And I'm kind of taking it in a biblical theological manner of going from the old to the new. Um, but I want to show you this dimension. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that, that it's real, even if we can't see it in this battle. So, 
2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 15. Then we're going to go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 15. This is the, the account of, uh, um, of Elisha and the, the servant. They're out in the desert, probably in some kind of a tent with a campfire, and, and um, they're being pursued by the enemies of God. Verse 15, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. So this servant of Elisha comes out of the tent. Maybe he's putting his Starbucks in his mug there at the, at the campfire, and he looks up and he sees the glitter of armor all around him. Maybe he starts seeing the heads of horses coming over the horizon. Maybe he started seeing these horses are pulling chariots, and they're coming to get Elisha. Um, and the servant said, Alas, my master, <laughs> what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid. Right. Now, I don't know about you. I read this and I think God does have a sense of humor. Uh, if there's just two of you and you've got warriors all around you and Elijah says, don't worry about it. Uh, For those who are with us are more than those who be with them. Hmm. Now, as we go through these couple of days, don't let your mind check out because it's a familiar text of Scripture. Put yourself in that young man's shoes, listening to Elisha say, there's more with us than to be with them. And he sees all these people all around them and he's going, one, two. Wait a minute, there's something I'm not catching here. And Elijah then connects the dots. Verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man And he saw, and behold, and now don't finish reading there yet, because in a few moments I'm going to talk about, you have have no windows in this this building. Maybe you do, I just can't see them. But um, um, I see light light coming in over there. So in your home, maybe you have windows with Venetian blinds, uh, or some kind of blinds, or curtains, and you can't see out for whatever's in, in the way. And at some point, maybe you raise the blinds, and you can see what you couldn't see before you raise the blinds. This is what's happening. God actually allows this young man to see into the dimension he can't normally see. And look at this. He opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold. Wow, I'll tell you what, I love that word. If I were there with Elisha, I would love this word, behold. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So the heavenly host... The heavenly army came and rescued them. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean the dimension isn't there. Now, Luke chapter 2. This is going to hit a little closer to home. It's actually a little more familiar. I have no idea what you do at Christmas time here. I think our first time in this uh, church was around Christmas time. But we weren't here for any kind of a Christmas program. um, But maybe you have children and they quote this this text. And if that's the case, again, please harness your mind to where you're not just completing the phrases as we go. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. This is, a, this is really a neat text. And this, if this is one of those, if you have trouble sleeping at night, read this text and just think about it. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with great fear, you think? By the way, if you saw an angel this morning, you would not probably sit in your chair. You'd be right on your face. Okay, this, was, this is um, great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. Why? Because they were fearing. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Familiar verses. Verse 12. And this shall be a sign for you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly, wham, there was, and wham is not in the original Greek here, but that's, that's, that is that's cross version. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So here is the rolling up of the, of the blinds, m- mortal man able to see into that dimension he can't normally see. And it causes them to be completely um, 
unnerved. In other words, um, there was, a, there was a, a great response to this. Now, from this point on this morning, we're going to enter into an area uh, that may to you or some of you almost sound like a foreign language. I don't know any foreign languages. I've studied foreign languages. I can't speak any foreign languages. Maybe you can. And maybe I'll just say a language that is foreign to you. Um, you start talking about corporate prayer in most churches, you start seeing the deer in the headlight look. Okay, you start seeing the gloss over. What are you talking? This is a, a language we don't even know. Now, obviously, you already know it because we prayed corporately this morning. And that's a great blessing. Very few churches, church services feel comfortable to do that. In fact, I was in a church. Uh, um, let's see, I think it was southeastern Ohio was in a church. And my uh, son, Stephen, often travels with me with, the, with us this morning. And, and uh, I don't remember if this is the church or not, but it was in a church. And as I was, as I, was I preached on corporate prayer. I preached on it in a, in a missional context. And as I, I said, let's close in prayer. And I said, in fact, let's congregation, let's pray together. And as, as we did, nobody prayed. So I prayed. And I started out, and I, I prayed, and then nothing happened. And the pastor turned to me, and he said, Pastor Rick, we don't do that. Whoa. So you obviously do that. I was completely taken back by that. And it's the only church that's ever happened in. But uh, for the most part, the matter of corporate prayer will really cause people to think. Uh, or it, at least it will cause people to have a low priority on it. It's really, you know, like we got lunch come up. It's Mother's Day. You know, corporate prayer. You mean Holy Spirit working in dramatic ways in our congregation. Um, you know, we got work coming up. This it's, it's a low priority. But think of this. Some of you will know... The name, well, I'm going to ask you this. Does anybody know the title of the sermon that a Puritan by the name of Jonathan Edwards is famous for preaching? Sinners in the hand of an angry God. Started what we know of today as one of the great awakenings, the first great awakening in our, in our society and started in, in New England. And many people see, and Jonathan Edwards, you can read it online, Jonathan Edwards stood and he read his sermon. It was almost in a monologue. It had very little emotion. And as a result of that, thousands of people trusted Christ as Savior. And many people say, well, Jonathan Edwards must have been a massive, mighty man of God. And ladies and gentlemen, he was. But he would tell you, it was not because of what I preached. It's because of my church who was praying for me. And they prayed for six months. They would come on Saturday night and Sunday morning and Monday night and Saturday morning. And they would pray for their pastor. And they were praying for an awakening in the church. And that church, that sermon wasn't preached in his church. But as they were praying, God, they prayed for six months before he preached that sermon. So that when he preached that sermon, it was like catapulted out of his heart. Not because of his own pulpiteering, but because of the corporate prayer that preceded it. So, that would have been uh, mid-1700s. If we go to the mid-1800s, some of you have been to New York City. New York City is my favorite city in the whole world. Um, I keep saying that maybe we'll re retire in New York City. My wife says, if you looked at our bank account, um, that's probably not going to happen. Very expensive place to live. But if you go to Central Park, and if you go to the southwest corner of Central Park, there's a big building there called Trump Towers. There's another building called the American Bible Society, which may not be there anymore because I think they just sold it. But outside the American Bible Society is a, is a statue of a man named Jeremiah Lamphere. It's a bronze statue. He's sitting down on a bench. He's got his arm around the bench. Bronze, and you can actually go and have this conversation with Jeremiah Lamphere. Jeremiah Lamphere is, was a businessman in New York City in 1857. He got burdened that God would stir the hearts of business people in New York City. And in 1857, he went to a, a, a church that wasn't actually his church, a church at the corner of Williams, uh, Williams and I can't remember the other name, um, and, and asked the pastor, could I have a noon prayer meeting and invite businessmen to come? The pastor said, absolutely. And he started knocking on business people's doors and inviting them to come. And the first prayer meeting, they had just a few. And then the next prayer meeting, they had more. And the next prayer meeting, they had more. And as a result of that, 
Um, they had in, in theaters and warehouses the place for two years. There were 10,000 people a week who were trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. In New York City. And he would say, yes, it is due to God's people praying together. But I found a document that, sta- that, that researches the church that he was a member of, which is a couple miles outside the city, had been praying for six weeks before he started praying in that city. There is great benefit from people praying together. Now, that was mid-1700s, mid-1800s. Many of you would know the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I just looked at the clock. Is it really 1120? It is. Yee. That's a fast... You guys have fast clocks. Um, and so we're going to... So, mid... Uh, last part of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon died in 1892. Pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Daughter and I were in Germany. We came through London and really enjoyed a Sunday morning service there. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was known as the Prince of Preachers. And this is what happened. Charles Haddon Spurgeon would stand in his pulpit on Sunday morning and he would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he would not have, as some churches have today, it's, neither, it's not necessarily bad or good. It's, it, they, would, they would have a, a come forward, they called him an altar call. And they would have, he wouldn't have an altar call. He said, if God is stirring the hearts of people, I have Mondays off, he would say. I have Mondays off. If your heart is touched by what I preach and you want to trust Christ as Savior, you come see me on Tuesday morning. Because, he said, I don't want just emotionalism. I don't want you to come in because some some friend urged you to do so. I want it to be something that you are in earnest to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And on Tuesday mornings, he would come to work and there would be people lined all the way down the street to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, or at least to hear more about what he preached on Sunday. And many have said, isn't he a massive pulpiteer? What a powerful preacher. And he actually had the newspaper come to his church and say, can you tell us the secret to what you're doing? There are so many people impacted in London that we're having to print your sermons on Monday that you preach on Sunday. We're having to have a a newspaper reporter in the congregation writing down every word you say because there are so many people that are interested in it and you are sweeping London with your gospel. He said, yes, I'll tell you the secret. He says, you come next Sunday morning and I'll show you the secret. Some of you know the story. It's very, very well known. Two hours before the service, he encouraged the newspaper reporters to come. And he said, I want to show you something. And he walked into the city, into the the church, and he opened up two large doors that entered the basement. He opened the doors and he showed them 300 people in the basement of the church two hours before the morning service praying for the preaching of God's word and the advance of the gospel. He said, this is the furnace room of our church. This is the cause for what Jesus Christ is doing in our church. Those 300 people left right before he preached and another 300 people filled that and they prayed through the entire sermon. And after Spurgeon preached an hour to two hours, hear that American ears, Um, an hour to two hours, he would leave, those 300 people would leave, and another 300 people would come to the basement of the church and pray for the working of God to continue through the hearts of people after the preaching. And we say, no big deal. We can do without God's people praying. And I suggest to you that there is so much that we need to adhere to to know the blessing of God in prayer. You don't need to turn to this text, but it's listed on your uh, your handout sheet. Daniel chapter 10 has the story of Daniel, and some of you will know the story. Daniel asked of the Lord, and can somebody tell me how long it took the angel of the Lord to get to Daniel with the response? Does anybody know? Or you can, 21 days, three weeks, it took the answer to get from God to Daniel. Hmm. Now I thought, and maybe you thought, and you would have thought correctly, that angels and answers to prayer can reach us in lightning speed. Absolutely they can, but evidently not here. And it not only took 21 days, it took the dispatching of the warrior angel Michael to come alongside the messenger of God to get to Daniel. So evidently, there was tremendous opposition, tremendous warfare in the dimension we can't see to answer Daniel's prayer. 
And so, my friends, I want to encourage you that we must pray, but we also must be persistent in our praying. Luke chapter 11. If you would turn there, we'll finish up with these, with these two texts. Luke chapter 11. This is often what's referred to as the Lord's Prayer, the first four verses of Luke chapter 11. A uh, full version of this is in Matthew chapter 6, but read with me uh, something that's, that's really unusual. Um, Luke chapter 11 and verse 5, And he said to them, Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. So somebody come and they don't have food, so they're coming to those, a neighbor's house to get food. Um, and I, uh, let's see, and will answer them from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. So knock, 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 go away. Knock, 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 go away. I'm in bed. Some other time. Verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, so the friendship didn't cut it. Yet because of his impudence, or impudence, however you want to phrase that, um, uh, he will rise, and this is, the word means persistence. It almost means irritating persistence. Okay? Middle of the night, my, son, uh, my son's working a security job, and he comes in at 3 or 4 in the morning. And um, so this is, this is, this is you know, <clears throat> um, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Don't you think? That, not, 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 go away, not, 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 go away. Okay, <laughs> whatever you need, just get out of here. All right? Um, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, or we could even say the one who keeps seeking finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. As I read this text as a pastor, it really bothered me because the, what I see here, it almost seems like we have to pester God. And maybe you've read it this way. But that doesn't match what we know about God. I'm going to suggest to you that this is not teaching that we are to nag and pester God. This is teaching us that spiritual warfare takes time. And it takes persistence. And we live in a culture that doesn't like either of those. We like to drive through McDonald's. We like to get our K-cups in a hurry. We like, to, we like to have everything fast with the least amount of effort possible. And that may be American culture, but it's not heaven culture. And if we're going to have the advance of the gospel and a strong church and do spiritual warfare the hearts of men and women, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to roll up our sleeves. We have to take time. We have to be on our faces together. There's another passage that's very similar to this, and it's the, it's the unjust judge in, in Luke chapter 18. Same thing. The lady comes to the judge asking for, a, a, asking for a, a judgment on her behalf, and you could just picture this judge saying, no, get away from me. I don't want you to hear this. I don't want to hear this. And she actually, I mean, I heard an evangelist paint this picture. It's almost as if she actually kind of follows him home. And I, I picture, you know, Fred and Barney Rubble and Flintstones. I don't think it means anything to you. But, uh, you know, this prehistoric uh, car, and he's sitting in a, in a house with, no, with block windows and no screen. And this lady, he's sitting down, the judge is sitting down at dinner, and, the, and, the, and this lady that's asking for a judgment sticks her head up in the window and says, Will you please hear my case? And he, she's just pestering him. And finally he says, yes, I will hear it. And again, I want to recommend to you that it's not, that the per, it's not the pestering, it's the persistence. And in that text, we find a, a very interesting phrase where the Scripture says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And here's the, here's the rub. Our Lord says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. He gives this illustration. He, at the very end of the unjust judge story, it says, is he gonna, when he comes back, he can find the faith on the earth. I recommend to you, when Jesus Christ comes, is, he's gonna find, is he really going to find people who know how to pray? Is he going to come and find people who just say, ho-hum, I'd rather, I'd rather have nothing and have ease than have God's working as a result of persistence. And so... How do we do battle in a dimension we can't see? And I'm going to recommend that we do this with God's people praying together. I'm going to conclude by reading something and then, um, then we'll be done. Um, we'll, we'll had, 
every intent of maybe doing some prayer time this morning. Maybe we'll do that next Sunday. Here's a little, a little blurb, if you will, by a, a, a preacher of the past named R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey was, was gifted at doing dramas, and he would, he would actually act out and, as if he were someone else. And in this regard, he's acting out as if he's Satan. And uh, he, says, he said this, um, this is Satan talking through R.A. Torrey. You may have your brilliant university-bred preachers and your high-priced choirs and your gifted sopranos and altos and tenors and basses and your wonderful quartets, your immense men's Bible classes, yes, your Bible conferences and your Bible institutes and your evangelistic services, all you please of them. So he's going through the things of normal churchianity. It does not in the least trouble me. I don't care. Go ahead, do it. If you will only leave out of them the power of the Lord God Almighty sought and obtained by the earnest, persistent, believing prayer that will not take no for an answer. And then R.A. Torrey converts to himself and he says this, when the devil sees a man or a woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray, and who really does pray, and above all, when he sees a whole church on its face before God in prayer, he trembles as much as he ever did for he knows that his day in that church or community is at an end. And so I think on, your, on the back side of your handout, a few principles of the matter of corporate prayer. Um, keep these in mind and next Lord's Day, we'll take some time in the, in the morning service and we will, as a congregation, I'll probably have you move to the center somehow so that everybody can hear what's going on. Um, um, consider this. Uh, develop a culture of spontaneous prayer. One of the things that we enjoyed in, in Longmont, Colorado, where I pastored, was at any given moment, in any, any given service, we could have a prayer time. Sometimes it was during the middle of a song. Sometimes it was during the announcements. We had a man trust Christ during the announcements. Um, uh, so spontaneous, um, almost as if really it's just the way we breathe. When it was in Ukraine this last summer, they prayed after communion. They prayed after the preacher preached. They prayed during the songs. They prayed after the songs. And nobody had to say, now's the time we're going to pray. They just prayed. It was fascinating. And they prayed 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, from a Westerner, I'm thinking, you know, my knee's hurting. And, uh, you know, and we had two other preachers to go yet. And they prayed, they preached that, they prayed after those guys preached. Um, and t- the, one of the things they said when in, during oppression, there's two things they couldn't take away from us. They, took, they couldn't take away God's word hidden in our heart, and they couldn't, couldn't take away us praying. And we need to learn some of that for the coming persecution in this country. Silence does not mean stagnation. stagnation. As we're praying, sometimes there is silence between the prayers. That's not a bad thing. Songs are prayers. I love, I looked around this morning when you guys were singing, and you could see people praying during the singing. And the, uh, Thank you for that. Songs are prayers. Uh, enjoy that. Pray the scriptures. If you're praying 15 minutes a day, you've probably already known that after you, after you get through a little bit of your, your prayer list, what do you do then? Uh, if you, as the early church, you're going to see the early church prayed the scriptures. You can pray theology. You can thank the Lord for his mercy and his grace and his loving kindness and his omnipresence. And you can go on all night, as many have. Um, verse 5, it's not so much what we pray, but that we are praying. Now that is a little odd statement. I'm going to recommend that you think about that and chew, about, chew on that. It's not so much that what we pray, it's that we are praying that does spiritual battle. And last of all, and if you get offended at this, then you just get offended. Um, resist the hospital list. Okay, grandma's got bunions. Uncle Charlie has warts. Uh, that's fine. But you're not going to find those kind of prayer things in the scriptures. You're going to find, in fact, you very seldom even see, see people praying for the unsaved in the scriptures. You see much about the glory of the Lord. You see much about praying the scriptures. You see much about his radiance and his worthiness. And, and uh, so... Resist the hot. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for the bunions and the warts. I'm saying those are minor things compared to the, the other things in Scripture. So uh, if, uh, if you want a, a project this, uh, today, I would enc- encourage you to, turn, uh, to read through the, the 63rd Psalm. Take this handout, underline the theology in the Psalm, uh, pray through this Psalm with a family, with your family, with others, and enjoy even studying toward next Sunday uh, the things that are found at the bottom. I'm going to encourage you. 
congregation that there is great fruit that can come from God's people praying together. It could turn this church inside out. It could turn the city inside out. And uh, God desires to do that, but he does desire to come from a local church, and he desires to come from a yearning heart that's willing to do battle in a dimension we can't see with persistence and faith. And may that be the case.